three. Three, two, one. Playing bigger. Frosty and Steve Wraith. Action. Right, if you can just say a bit of the camera about, just give us your name, age, and what you did in the 1960s, you know, how, how you got to know the, the craze, etc. Right, I'm Bill Frost. I'm 73. How did you get to know the craze? I knew the craze from way back in the days. I met him in a place called the Royal at Tottenham when I was on the ramp in the army. And I sort of was on and off with him over a period of 20 years. Did you work for the, the, the Chris? Yeah, I was Ronnie's driver. Ronnie's um, driver? Yeah, I was Ronnie's driver, yeah. What was it like? Driving Ronnie career around. I liked Ronnie, yeah, he, he, he was always a very nice fella and he was always very good to me. And I was sorry when everything went skew with and I'm sorry he's not here now. Did you get pulled in, Phil, when the craze were arrested? Were you no, well, when the craze were arrested, I was on the run myself. Reggie Creek, did you have much to do with Reggie? Yeah, I, I, I had quite a bit to do with Reg. I sometimes drove him about when I didn't drive uh, Ronnie about. I, most times I drove both of them about when I were together. What was your average day then? You know, you, would, you, you say you were a driver. What, was, what would an average day entail driving a crate twin around the East End of London? Well, well, I had to get up, go to Valence or wherever we were and run here and run there with them, whatever, you know, whenever I was wanted. Did you see, um, you started driving Ronnie Cree, what, what year would you see you started driving Ronnie around? On a regular basis? In about 62. 62. So between 62 and 69, did, did you see a change? Did, did you personally see a change? You obviously knew them well. Did you see much of a change in the personalities and their, their appearance? Yeah, well, I see, like, uh, a few changes, you know. Uh, I used to visit Ronnie when he was on the ramp in that house, now and again, when he was out in Suffolk in the caravan. And in the end, he became so ill that I went with Charlie, Reggie, and Tom Brown, the bear, and we brought him back to London round to his mum's. And they said the best thing was it was to get uh, some milk for him. And they phoned a family doctor, who was a Dr Blasker, and he come round and he made arrangements and they took Ronnie back to the mental home. What was Valence Road like? What was the house at Valence Road like? It was a normal East End house, like, you know, uh, I suppose it was the same for working class people all over Great Britain, the sort of home, you know. And it was nothing sort of special, you know, although they both had nice flats, Ronnie and Reggie. Reggie had a flat at uh, Manor Lee, at Manor House, and Ronnie had a flat in Stoke Newington, in uh, Cotton of Court. East End now, when you look around, I mean, has it changed much over the last... 40 years, you know. Oh, it's changed, changed vastly, yeah. For the better or the worse? Oh, I, I like the old East End. I'm not so keen on the, the East End there it is now, you know. I'm going back to the days when all the docks were going, you know. People were more friendly, more neighbourly. Now, you know, everyone's got sort of televisions and they all do their own thing. There's no neighbourly. Neighbours, like no more. People want to keep their self to their self and have their own companies. You know, like it used to be. When the Crays were arrested, how, how did you feel personally? Well, well I, I was a little upset about it because it weren't only the Crays, a lot of my friends were arrested with them, you know. And at the time, when they got arrested, I was on the run. And I was on the run for nine years. You know, and 
it, it's not easy when you're on the run to live. What about the sentences that the careers received? Well, I reckon I was over the t top in myself, you know. And all right, they got life, they got 30 year each, but I never let either of them out, you know. I mean, the people they killed, they weren't honest, straight people. They were all villains themselves who they killed. They were all the, all the same sort of people as what they were. What did you think of Jack that personally? Did you have much to do with him? What, yeah, well, what did you think of Jack the Hatmuth as a person? Describe I Jack, really Jack liked Jack the uh, if he, he, he was a very generous fella. He was the life and soul of any party, you know. And I, I really felt sorry that they killed him. Like a lot of people on the firm felt the same way. What you know, it was very tragic what happened to him. What about George Cornell? Well, I got on, on all right with George when I was a younger fella. George helped me out quite a bit, you know. And I know him and Ronnie fell out because one night, eight o'clock at night, I was in the Grave Morris and Ronnie wanted to go to the Stalk Club in Swallow Street in the West End. And I drove them there, him and Reggie. And when we arrived there, We walked into the club and sitting there was Georgie Cornell. And what I didn't know, I didn't know they had a pre-arranged meeting with him. And Ronnie wasn't going to sit with him, wouldn't have nothing at all to do with him. He went and I went and sat with Ronnie at another table and Reggie sat and talked to George Cornell. And when we come out of the club, we was only in there half hour, it was early evening and they weren't really open to business. I come out of there, we got in the car, Ronnie sat at the side of me, Reggie sat in the back, and I never spoke a word to one another until we got back to the pub in Wetchup with the Grave Morris. And then I went and sat on another table and had a chat, you know. And I'd sat, I'd, it was more or less about two weeks to that day that Ronnie C. George's Cornell's car outside the blind beggar. He used to have a blue zapper with a big horse's head on the bonnet of it. He see that car and he went back to the Green Dragon Club, got a gun, and him Barry got a gun as well. He came back to the blind beggar when he shot George in the head and um, you know that was what happened obviously you knew about the murders how how did you feel did you, did your attitude change or were you were you still loyal to the the cause of it but I had to be loyal to the twins you know I, I, I mean I like George Cornell but like the twins he was no angel you know he Done his share of violence uh, and whatnot, you know. George was a tough character himself. Did you ever feel threatened yourself? Did, you know, with Jack the Hat obviously working for the twins at some point, and you know, basically, you know, in in, in words of other people, you know, they the, the killed one of their own. Now, did, did you not possibly feel that the tables might get turned on you one day, or that, that there could be some kind of you know day when? Your card was up to, you know, that no, when they, well, they did, when they killed Jack the Hat, I wasn't actually on the firm. I thought it was a little bit dangerous for me to be associated with him at the time because I was wanted for uh, a long-term fraud that I, I was involved with. And I, and I weren't on the firm, but I learned after the people on the firm what they'd done. And, there was quite a few of the firm who didn't like the idea of what they'd done to Jack. What about Eric Mason? We're down here with Eric today. What's your views on Eric? I think Eric is a really lovely bloke, you know. He's never really harmed anybody. He's just a, a, a lovely regular fella, you know. I've known Eric a long while. We served sentences together on Dartmoor and in ones and other prisons, and we associated with people like a lot of the train robbers, Bruce Reynolds, 
uh, Annette and we was on Dartmoor together and Mitchell was there, another one who the twins had killed. So, you know, Eric was never involved in any of that sort of thing. He was, he was always a good thief when he was young, Eric. Frank Mitchell, you touched on him. What, what, you know, what was Frank Mitchell like? Frank. Uh, a very big, powerful man. He was very strong. I don't think anyone would have really uh, stood much chance of having a, a fight or anything like that with him. He was a man of immense strength. But he was very childish in, in, in himself, you know. And I never ever knew Frank Mitchell all the time I knew him in prison and like other people tell you in prison. I never ever knew him, knew of him another prisoner. That's great. Excellent. Right. Rusty, fantastic. You're That's welcome, my son. Absolutely brilliant, mate. Yeah. Thank you. Lenny Hamilton, I forgot to do this before and I should have. Second, second interview, second interview with Lenny Hamilton outside the blind beggar. Three, two, one. Lenny, I just want to ask you about uh, the Craze Three Victims. First off, Jack the Hat. Uh, Jack, well, Jack, Jack yeah, was my mate. And uh, he's just like anyone else. Uh, he'd had a few drinks and not always, but sometimes, you know, and he got a little bit out of hand, but uh, it didn't mean nothing, you know. And when they tried to put him down, that he was a tuppenny apeny crook, and he, well, he was a good thief. He was getting plenty of dough, you know. And uh, when they said he threw his wife out the car, and but it's a load of lies. Jack would never do that, like, you know. Like, he loved the birds. Who don't? Who didn't? You know what I mean? He's not on his own, you know. And. Uh, Jack the Hat was on a, a gold bullying job down to them and uh, they got thousands of, hundreds of thousands of pounds it was worth and all the crazy game was three grand and that's why he went, he went down to Regency with a gun I bought him, it was an American service revolver they said he went down there with a shotgun with a load of lies he went down there, he got a bit drunk and I was drinking with him that afternoon in the Salisbury in Bulls Pond Road and he saw him going down and he said I'm going to fucking kill them bastards I said, Jack, don't leave it out. I said, it ain't working. But at night time, he did go down there. He'd have shot him if they'd have been there. I was just going to say to you, did Jack the Hat have the capability of killing the Cray Twins? Pardon? Do you think Jack would have had the capability of being... Oh, yeah, killed he would have done it. He would have done it that night. You know, because another time, he come over to me, I was living in East Ham. And uh, this is when I bought the gun, and I phoned up to say, I've got a present for you, Jack. So when he come over, I gave him it in the shoebox. And then he opened it, it's a cool, lovely late night, because he loved guns, like, he always carried a little gun, didn't like, you know? Anyway, I'll give him the gun. Oh, lovely, he said, I've got something for them outside. I said, what's that? He said, I'll show, he said, I said, go out and bring it in. So he went out, come back. He had it in like, a bit of a blanket thing. He's unwrapped it, he's only got a hand grenade in it. I said, what are you going to do with that? He said, I'm going down here, I'm going to wait for them to come home. He said, I'm going to fucking fling and blow them up. I said, you can't do it, Jack. I said, because you're going to injure other innocent people in the flat, so you can fucking blow people up. So we finished that. I got, got him and I went, I took him down to the Thames and we threw it in the Thames. But he would have he would have thrown it in there. He would have blown them up that night, you know. What about George Cornell? Uh, well, I used to work in Billingsgate Fish Market years ago. Uh, I'm going back to uh, 1946. You know, and uh, George had an empty warehouse down there. Oh, he's a hard man, George. And um, I used to work at Mac Fisheries. I start work for him about up past 10, 11. But Georgie and his brothers always fighting Jimmy. So they had an empty warehouse, had a load of empties out this day. So as I'm going home, Georgie gave me a call. He said, here, Len, you want to do us a favour? He said, a few quid for you. I said, what's that, George? He said, uh, I've got to get these empties out today because they used to come down with all some carts then, you know, from the railway. And he said, would you give us a hand? I said, yeah, George. And that's how I started with him. And every time he had empties to go out, I had to do the empties, like, you know. But then another time, he was drinking with a pal of mine who lives in, I uh, can't tell you where, on the continent now. He's a multi-millionaire. And uh, he was drinking with him in a pub just up the road here called the Bra uh, Brown Bear. 
Well, somehow the, the twins must have seen him in there. I've phoned them up. I got that on. I said, Georgie Cornell's in the ground there. You know? Oh, because they always had the ump with one another. And what Frankie Fraser said, that they were supposed to lie, because they ate it. And the twins ate it, you know? So anyway, uh, there, he went down there with a the driver, Ronnie. He sent the driver in. He said, if Cor see Cornell's in there. And Georgie was in there. He's come out. He said, Georgie Cornell's in there. He's having a drink with Sansa. Oh, so we go out and tell him someone wants to see him outside. So he's gone and said, George, someone wants to see you outside. It was Ronnie Cray. Now, no one knows, this has never come out. George, Ronnie Cray, he's got to stick one on Georgie, but he could have a fight, George. He's not Ronnie Cray out, hasn't he? <laughs> That's where the needle is. No, they're saying it back. He did call him a buff. He called him it when we was coming out the Aston one. But the needle was, when Georgie knocked him out, Every time he see Cornell, it was he was an embarrassment to him, wasn't it? It wasn't so much of the Richardson things; it was a load of balls, you know. But that was his embarrassment because not many people knew that, you know. What about Frank? Did you know much about Frank? Yeah, old Frank. But he was a he was a nice fella. He was a, a bit slow. He wasn't bad. He was slow, like you know, but a lovable fella, and he used to. We used to stay on the corner of Padet Road and Marlin Road there, like when we was kids. He'd come up, if he wasn't in Ballstall, <laughs> he'd come along and pick you up with one hand, like that, <laughs> Frank. But a lot of lies went about how they could. This is what gave me the ump when they called him the mad axe and was a load of rubbish. Because Frank would never hurt elderly people and he wouldn't hurt kids. He'd only hurt people that hurt had a guy him. And what he was doing that day, when he got out of Rampton, he got out of Rampton Mental Institution, he escaped from there, and he couldn't go down the lanes because all the old bills going down there, right? So he was going across the fields, and he came across a small holding where, no one you saw, saw a tree up, got the big, right? He came across this old boy, got the things up with a chopper, you know, a big axe, and thanks more or less said to him, oh, go on, Pop, you go and have a rest and all. And that's what he was doing, chopping logs up. The, the fella's wife was even making him something to eat. But when the old Bill would come across, they see him swinging the axe, chopping the wood, and they made out he threatened the people when he was he demo. He would never do that. He would never do that, Frank, not in a million years. You know, he was so well liked in the East End. Oh, he'd done a lot of bird and that. He'd never harm anyone, not unless they harmed him. But the, um... when they got him out of when they got him out the nick out of um, Dartmoor, they said they got him out to get him a, a release a, a release date with a load of bullets. They knew that Nipper Reed was on the point of nicking him, and they got him out to kill Nipper Reed. And you can ask Nipper Reed. Nipper Reed had to change his when he come out to Tintagel House. He had to change his route every time he went home. He never took the same. You know, but that's what they got, and he wouldn't do it. So you, people are telling so many lies, you know, they don't know nothing about, you know, and they're making their own things up as they go along. But that's the truth. Do you think the and I'll tell you that, else? eh? Do you think the Chris killed anybody else? I know seven they killed. One, two, three, four of them was my mates. They killed a boy in um, Columbia Road, um, Brian Scully. Reggie cut his front all over a bird. Uh, they killed Billy. He was a good thief. They went in to rob a geezer who owned a spill up here called the Green Dragon. Him and um, another fellow, Jewish fellow, they was partners, but they was the biggest buyers of Bent Tom in England, they was, like, you know. And the twins knew that they had a load of Tom there. So they wanted my mate to go and screw the geezer's ass and have the gear like you know and i said you can't do that he's a good man i said matty i said you can't rob matty what can i do i said we'll have it away and stay out of sight for two a couple of months and never get all about it you no know, what do you do he goes up the club he's playing the clubs in paddington the blue rose in paddington uh they found out he's in the blue rose in paddington they sent the geezer in there to see if he's still in there and he's come out of one of their blokes, he said, Jerry's in there. He's, he's, he's pissed. They waited outside. 
he come out, he couldn't hardly stand, he's on the wall like that, hold yourself up. They've jumped out the car, the twins, and they've fucking done it. They killed him, they kited him away, don't know what they done with the body. But I think where all the other bodies went, they was burnt in a... a sh Billy Exley, who was with the twins right from the beginning, used to come and see me when I was in Nick. And I used to send a visit to someone's house, not his own house, someone's house where he'd get it and he'd come and see me. And uh, Billy said to me, that all this rubbish going about, the bodies are buried in, under the, uh, in cemeteries and all this, he said, the flyovers. He said, then, then bodies were took to South London and there was an old Polish geezer had a, a smelt, you know, used to melt metal and they put the bodies in a deep freeze, cut them up when they was frozen, no blood, and put them in the, in the smelt and that's how they went. Well, he said to me when he came to Nick up one to him, he said to me, uh, they've, they've been uh, cremated. Well, I thought they was like in a crematorium, but that's what he meant. They was cremated in these melting pots. Can you just clarify the four names that you said for the... Pardon? Four names for the camera of the people who you said, you know, of the, the other victims that you said. What was it you said? It was of the people who you say that the, that the craze killed. Billy, Billy was one of them. What were, what were the names of the people that you you, you think were the other murders? Uh, well, I know the event boy they done it. I, yeah. don't, I didn't know him, right. but uh, my mate was their driver at the time. Yeah. And Ronnie had a event boy in uh, the West End. He took him off the streets and got him a flat. Put him in, got him in a flat up the West End. He paid for everything. He bought him clothes. Oh, he's good-hearted, Ronnie Cray. He wasn't a greedy person. No, he wasn't. He, money didn't worry him. Not like Reggie. <laughs> but Ronnie uh, had it, he bought him jewellery and everything. But then they're going down to a caravan they had in Steeple Bay in Essex for the weekend. And they're taking a rent Ronnie's boy. So as they're going along, Ronnie's got on a gin and tonics. He's half pissed. He started slapping the boy back uh, around the face. Him and Reggie's having a row, because Reggie's sitting in the front, pack it in like you'll get a snake knife, you know what I mean? When they got to Steeple Bay, they brought the guy out the car, he's pissing out of him. He's got to grab the boy, the boy's front of Reggie. But Reggie was just opening the door of the caravan. As they'd gone in, the boy's front of Reggie. Right? Ronnie's come in, they've had a row, he's got all the boys staying with him. They got the clo clothes off the, uh, the bed in there. Got my mate to get the clothes off the bed. They wrapped him up in the bedclothes, put him in the boot of the car. My mate said, I'll shit myself. Then he said, I could have got done a murder. Like being involved in a murder. He drove him back to Valence Road, parked the car around the corner, and they said to him, this is their words again, don't breathe a word of this, he's been dead, you'll go with him. And I said, what happened to the bodies? I don't know, then he said, I went home. Why did he never, he never pursued these, you know, these other stories? No. A lot of people didn't know about this, right? Cause, cause I've, never never said, I've never told anyone. Never Reed said seven as well. That was hey? interesting. You say seven and he says seven. Oh, look, oh, that's it. Seven, seven. Oh, seven, seven seems to be a familiar number, you know. Yeah. And... I know they'd done a geezer, uh, his wife, the geezer's wife, I think she worked in uh, as well as Baum, but they had in the West, in the West End. Oh, they'd done her old man in Brighton, you know, but see, they had so much, many old Bill, bent old Bill on the fur. Now they're going to get nicked. And that's where they thought they could get away with, well, they was getting away with murder. And the old Bill was getting, what did they do? They were well, that sack off the Metropolitan Police when they nicked the craze, didn't they? This asked, and they thought they was untouchable. And then Nick Reed came to see me in the prison. I was in Nick. He said, I've been looking for you 18 months now, so I've been here fucking years. <laughs> and he said to me, they went, that's when they, Wanted to shoot my two kids. So he says to me, we've been to see the barmaid in the, in here, in the blind bagger, and if you do a statement, sign this statement, she'll do it as well, she'll sign. And they said a lot of other people will sign up if you sign up. He said, but we, we've got police officers watching your children 24 hours a day. If you don't sign up, we can't afford to. I said, it stands for reason. I said, well, right, give us it. I signed up. And that's how they all started signing up. Yeah.
talk your length. Thanks well, a lot again. Ah, that's that's, that's what great. said, Martin Bashir. Yeah. I could, I could talk your length. Done it. That's just not his face or anything. Is, like that. Is the plants are wet. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Right. Steve Wraith with Jeff Mason outside the blind beggar or one. Jeff, we're down in, and um, obviously we had a good, great day walking around the East End of London with your dad. Um, yeah, first, mem first memories of your dad. First memories of your dad. First, really. first memories of dad, um, I suppose, really was going up from Paddington Station to go and visit him uh, on the first time he was uh, incarcerated at Dartmoor. Um, I was only young. Um, very young child, but you know, every time I, I see old films of diesel locomotives, and uh, it always brings me back to the time, you know, of going up this, that long journey down to Dartmoor to see him. Of course, in them days, no physical contact at all, you know, I, I talked to Dad through a uh, three-inch plate glass with wire, you know, and the visits weren't very long, and then we had the arduous journey all the way back to London, you know, that, that was probably the first early memories of Dad. Uh, of course, when he came out, um, he was at home only for a couple of years, and then of course, you know, he got into more trouble, and Dad went away. It was very hard because being at school, you have to try and explain, you know, to the children why your dad's there one minute and why he's he's in your life the next, and he's gone again. So, yeah, it was difficult really for me, you know. But, uh, it's probably made me the character I am, you know. I've had to deal with it, so. What did you think of your dad? I mean, were you, were you proud of him? Were, you know, I mean, I'd, I've never been in that position myself. What, what do you feel like when your dad's in, in prison? Very in, sad, yeah. uh, but at the same time, dad was a product of the environment uh, at the time when he was growing up, obviously during the war years. Uh, I'm not, you know, saying everyone during the war, you know, was going to turn to crime, but it was just unfortunate enough that dad was brought into the circumstances and, and that was the career, in a way, that, that followed, you know, it was just a natural path, I think, from the first time he got into trouble at the age of 14, and uh, and that was it, basically. Um, I've got no animosity about Dad not being in my life. Uh, far from it, you know. Um, I think it was just circumstances, and that was it. His best when he was at home, always tried his best, so... What about your dad's associates? I mean, your dad's knocked around with some pretty high-profile, notorious villains throughout his life, and uh, yeah, yeah. you know, did you get a chance to meet any of them throughout I, the course of your yeah, life? Yeah, of course, uh, I was still young then, um, growing up, but I did go to Valence Road on several occasions. Um, the only real memories I've got of Valence Road is sitting in the kitchen with uh, the old man Charlie and uh, having a minor bird as well for company, and it was constantly rabbiting on, and. Uh, Ronnie would constantly turn up with different exotic birds, you know, from the market, like macaws and parrots, you know, and the old man was going mad, you know, he'd, he'd, he'd often wondered what he's going to come home with next. Um, that's about the earliest memories, I think, of uh, Dad's associates. Uh, as I say, I was, I was still pretty young. Um, yeah. Have you any memories of um, the unfortunate victims of the careers, Jack, Jack McVitie, George Cornell, and... Yeah. And obviously Frank Mitchell, you were very young, but have you got any memories yeah, of any of yeah, those? Yeah, I people? did I did meet Jack um, when we was living at Mill Hill at the time. Uh, I believe Jack was going over to Muswell Hill, which was not uh, too you know too far away. And he had an old black Vauxhall Wyvern and uh, he, he lent it to Dad for about a week. And uh, Dad used to say to me in the morning before going to school, Do you want to fire the car up? You know, warm the motor up. And uh, anyway he gave me a ten shilling note, he said, Don't tell Mum. Of course, I was the uh, I was the talk of the school. You know, I got a tent. I was treating everyone. The following morning, he said, "Can you start the car up again?" I said, uh, "Is there another ten bob note in it, Dad?" He said, "Don't be cheeky," you know. And uh, then I got to meet Jack McVitie. Uh, of course, still didn't know. You know, I knew he was one of Dad's high-profile associates, but he seemed a very, very nice guy for what I remember. You know, and that was it. I know Dad speaks very highly of Jack, so. It, it, uh, and Dad's no fool when it comes down to friends, so, you know, in my book, I think Jack would be a very sound, sound guy. There's one particular incident in your life when your dad came out of prison and you were, you're a musician yeah. by trade, and, yeah. you know, that was one of those situations I'd, yeah. I'd love to go into. You know, what was it like that particular night? Can you explain the circumstances, yeah. etc., and what it was like that night your dad came in? Yeah, I was, I was quite surprised because um, I'd always been interested in music, you know, from uh, early days at school. Was in the school choir and the rest of it, and then 
it was just a natural progression. I just, you know, uh, played guitar, formed a band. Um, and, and then we just got obviously better and better as the years went on. But this particular night, we was playing um, a pub in North London, the Plough in Kingsbury. And uh, Dad just showed up. It was uh, just on the spur. And he had one of the Clark twins, famous uh, for the Royal Variety show back in the 60s, uh, Steve Clark, I believe it was. And uh, it was it was brilliant, you know, just seeing Dad and uh, talking to one of the greats, if you like, from the 60s, you know, Steve Clark. Um, he invited us over to Kenya uh, to play uh, for a whole season at the Memory Inn there. Sorry, the Holiday Inn. But unfortunately, uh, our drummer couldn't make it and we couldn't, you know, get another drummer that quick. So, yeah, very sad. You know, I should have done that, really, but... Um... The East End now, we've been, we've been around the East End today. I mean, memories of the East End, do you think it's changed for the better or for the worse? My personal reason? Personal, yeah, personal opinion. My personal opinion? I think it's changed for the work, absolutely, yeah. Um, the real the real East End, um, don't forget I, I come from North London, but obviously I came down here several times, you know, for work and the rest of it, got to know people. Um, I think it has changed for the worse. It's got uh, too cosmopolitan for me. Uh, that's my honest opinion. Um, I don't think the real East End has been driven out. I mean, obviously it started back in the 60s, um, and it has got, you know, gradually worse. But that's the way life has changed. Your dad's obviously been released from prison last November. Um, his current sentence, as we all know, was in a, a fit up. There's no other, there's no other word for it. Yeah. How do you feel about that? And I think it was absolutely disgusting uh, what happened. Um, obviously, he's not the only person uh, to be fitted up, and won't be the last. Um, but if there's any justice in the world, then it will all come out um, in one way or other. And hopefully he'll get, certainly if his name cleared, because um, I know Dad and he certainly doesn't deal with, with drugs. And uh, I knew it was complete fit up the minute I heard the charge. So I just hope that it all comes out in the wash. Why do you think they, they targeted your dad? Very high profile, basically. Um, my honest opinion is that they probably tried to get him years ago, you know, on probably higher things, and they were clutching at straws. That's my honest opinion. Um, just the fact he's very, he's very high profile. The careers are obviously all gone now. Um, you know, how did you feel as a child when the careers were sentenced? You know, did was there any repercussions? You know, throughout your life, did, did you have did you have any feelings about the careers going away? Did you know? Did your dad speak to you much about the careers and his involvement with them? He did. Um, my my own reaction really was uh, shock with the sentencing. I think um, 30 years for the twins. I know you can't excuse murder, but looking back on certainly some of the sentences that they were dishing out at the time uh, for murderers, it certainly wasn't in the 30 year. Uh, so yeah, I, I was quite shocked. At, you know, at the sentencing they dished out, especially for the twins. I think, uh, on reflection, that possibly they should have got the same for some of the other members, say 15 years, possibly. Um, don't forget the two chaps, you know, that were murdered was, you know, they were living the same lifestyle in a way. I know it doesn't excuse it, but there is the old story: you live by the sword, you know. So. Um, but I did think 30 years was harsh, yeah. yeah. Even though Dad did say uh, about Jack that that was wrong. You know, what, what Reg done to uh, Jack, Jack McVitie he was definitely wrong, and I totally agree, you know. But uh, Dad know, obviously knows more than me. Um, as I say, you know, it's just what Dad tells me. Mm. So. As far as the career story's concerned, it's a, it's a legend that's always going to live on. Why, why do you think that is? Why do you think that now, you know, the career dynasty's gone, that people are still so obsessed with the, the actual, the legend, the story, I feel like? Why do you think it's, there's always that interest? I think, I think there always will be, uh, to be quite honest. Um, we've, we've had heroes like in the past, Dick Turpin, so on. Um, I think the craze, if you like, con uh, compared to the American, uh, like Al Capone, you know, they are the nearest we've got to the American gangsters, in a way, you know, and I think there always will be an interest, always. Um, don't forget they come out from an era when there was a word, respect, 
and there was that old code of, code of honour. You know, they all lived by a code of honour. Even the police, you know, that they were, it was seen as a code of honour between the two. Um, nowadays, you can't you can't see it in the same. You know, it's respect no more. There's no code of honour. Uh, I, I think the Cray twins certainly try to live upon a certain code. Uh, I know it did spiral sometimes, you know, out of bounds, but um, ultimately that was the cause of their downfall. Brilliant, Jeff. Yeah. Fantastic. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jeff. Cheers, Chris. A closer room with a mic. I'm going to, yeah. yeah. Did you see your name and um, your involvement with the Crays, you know, how you got into the Crays? There's Martin, I'm age 62. Met Charlie in 1960. You just look at me and, and just, just talk naturally, right? You, you met Charlie in 1960. What was Charlie like, Les? Charlie was a charming, excellent man, in my opinion. He was like a, a second dad. Um, I got in a little bit of trouble. Um, my mother kicked me out. I had nowhere to go. I went to Charlie. He got me fixed up with a place up in Clapton. And when I got up there, I was surprised because there was a lot of kids like me, you know, thrown out for no apparent reason, just silly arguments. Up. But, you know, he, he was um, like a father figure. Uh, to everyone throughout his life, um, whether it was later years or the, or the early years, you know, that's, that's why I looked at Charlie. What about the twins? I didn't have a lot to do with the twins, really, I, because I wanted to join the firm. I wanted to join the firm. When uh, Tony and Chris Lambiana, because they had their own little thing going, Tony and Chris, um, and then they joined the firm, and I said to Charlie, uh, Tony one night, join the firm, and Charlie said, you stay out of it. You know, he knew, he knew deep down that something was going to come off, you know. Why did you want to join the firm? Part of it, I suppose. You know, a little bit of glamour. Um, as you know, they've gone down in history now as Britain's only gangsters. Um, today's, well, they're not gangsters today, they're just, just thugs, that's all, in my opinion. You know, they had a code of conduct. What about the East End, Les, the changes you've seen over the years from the 1960s to present day? Is it for the better or for the worse, in your opinion? Personally, I think, it, I think it's worse in the East End now. You know, it's... Um, the old days, you could leave your back door open, you know, uh, people could walk in. All right, there weren't a, a lot of things about it. You know, you had your TV, you had your stereogram, but not like today. You've got your video recorders, you've got your camcorders, you've got MP3s. You leave your door open a the day, they'd nick the bloody lot. You know, simple as that. But I'm glad that I'm used it. I'm really glad. What about the sentences that the Crays received? Do you think they were too harsh? Do you think they were...? Well, I, I, I heard that Ronnie was going to get 40 years. Um, that's what I heard. But when it came down to 30, and years later, when I met up with um, John Mills, uh, John Platt Mills QC, who defended Ronnie at the trial, and I used to meet him on a regular basis, and we used to talk about the old days. And I, I asked him about, why did Melford Stevenson give him 30 years? And he said, well, Reggie was only supposed to have got 20. And I asked him why. And he said, well, in Melford Stevenson's autobiography, the famous trials at the old bailer that he presided over, um, he was told by higher-ups that Reggie must receive 30 years. Higher-ups meaning? Um, the Attorney General's office. The Home Office, there's a programme that goes out on BBC One, I tell everyone to watch, it's called Judge John Deed. Uh, the Home Office and the Attorney General's Office are always telling judges what to do, um, which they shouldn't do. You know, a judge has been uh, selected to preside over criminal cases. Um, they're the ones that send people to prison. It's not the politicians, the politicians just make the laws in the House of Commons, or the House of Lords. Do you think the Chris killed other victims? Do you think they killed other people? Uh, there's a possibility that they did, yeah. There's a possibility. As for the victims that they did get convicted of, Jack McVitie, George Cornell, do you have any memories of them? Did, did you meet them? Did you know them? Did you have any opinion of them? Well, up in, up in uh, just past... Jack, the other... Jack, the, Jack McVitie. Jack, Jack McVitie, the, Jack the Act was... Um, he used to go in the ABC, which was a big restaurant here in uh, Whitechapel. He's going there on a Saturday morning and he used to be shouting out, fuck the craze and all this and that, you know, sitting there popping pills. 
But from the feedback that I got back from Charlie, that he'd, um, he'd done him out of some money and he was becoming an out and out pester him. But why they killed him, I, you know, I, I just don't, just don't make sense. You know, if they had, they had connections with the mafia in America with the uh, Genovese family, well, why didn't they get a couple of the guys from across the pond to, uh, you know, do it for them? You never find a Don going out and killing a bloke. It's always, the, you know, the soldier's dam. I mean, so Carlo, Carlo Cambino, he, he, he never killed anyone. He never got prosecuted for, all, you know, he was running the uh, Gambino family in New York. What about George Cornell? Well, George Cornell, to me, uh, I, I never met the guy, um, but what I was told that the shooting over that was because of um, Dickie Hart, a friend of Ronnie's. Um, Ronnie said to him, where are you going? So I'm going over South London. Went to a night spot over there, Mr Smith's. The other gang come in looking for um, the Richardson mob. The guns went off and um, got shot. So the following night, Ronnie got to hear about it and walked in the blind beggar and banged out the suit. What about Frank Mitchell? I don't think they should have topped Frankie Mitchell. I spoke with uh, Freddie Foreman about it. You know, uh, they couldn't be turned into prison because that would be a sort of grasping, wouldn't it? You know, so the only way out was to um, have him taken out. You know, and on Charlie's funeral, I saw the system, um, the bridge down Old Ford Road, you know, uh, not Old Ford Road, um, Roma Road with placards, you know. Uh, they should never have taken him out, should never have taken him out. Last part, Les, Charlie Cray. Obviously, Charlie was involved in a major police sting and ultimately given a 12 year sentence, which turned out to be his death sentence. What's your views on, on that particular operation by the police? I think it was an out and out. Um, from what I found out, um, there was a guy in Newcastle who knew a certain bloke in Birmingham. The deal was that they wanted a big fish and Charlie was the big fish. And he was sold down the river. As you know, Steve, I sat throughout that trial for the whole trial and there was points of law there which were never even brought up at his three appeal hearings. You know, not one. I mean, so one Friday, there was me, <coughs> another guy, and Hopper, sitting up in the public gallery. And the judge sent the jury out, and he, he said to uh, Kelsey Fry and Goldberg that um, he's going to direct the jury to bring in a bogus verdict on Monday. Charlie phoned me on a Friday night, and he said, what do I mean by a bogus verdict? I said, what are they going to do? They're going to find you guilty on, not guilty on both counts. So I said, you're going to walk on, on, on Monday. Even the copper said that. But when it come that you got 12 and an 8, you know, that, that was it. That was it. I, I was absolutely devastated, like a lot of other people, you know. There's Dad being locked up for something he hasn't done. But what we found out is that um, since that happened, we know where the drugs come from, we know where the money come from. And the drugs come from the two bodged up in Newcastle and the, and the money come from the two serious crime squad. So, and it's, and it's been back to the Criminal Cases Review Commission twice now. Um, Does the fight still go on? Then yeah, it's to still clear Charlie's yeah, name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember him saying on his deathbed, will you, um, will you fight to clear my name? And I said, yes, I will, you know. So we've got the right lawyers now. Um, and when it goes back to the Court of Appeal, hopefully we get the right result. You've been a seasoned campaigner for the Crays. Um, as far as long as I've known you, you've always been there and thereabouts, and you've, you've done a lot behind the scenes for the Crays. Yeah, yeah. Is that because you didn't get the chance to join the firm? I suppose it was in a way, Steve. Um, as you know, with Reggie, <coughs> I went places where other people didn't go. I remember I had a meeting with um, the Lord Chief Justice of England, Lord Taylor. Sadly, he died. Um, he phoned me up one day, or, or his secretary, and said that um, he'd like to see me at the High Court. I went up there, and he said this meeting might last only half an hour, and it lasted about an hour and a half. And he asked me the simple question about Reggie. Do you think it's right that politicians should release lifers? And I said no. And he said to me, well, who's 
I said, well, you sent people to prison. I said, it's your job to... Um... I said, all this parole board and all that, I said, it's a waste of time. You know, you've got innocent people in prison who shouldn't be there. You know, Reggie, Reggie should have should have been out. Um, I even met Mo Molum. Um, what a lovely lady she was. Um, when the Labour government got elected, I thought that Tony Blair was going to make her the, uh, the first Home Secretary. And I met her one day, and we were discussing Reggie's case, and she asked Roberta to phone her, but Roberta totally ignored her. And now, if Mo Molum had helped her, Reggie would have been out, rather than coming out on compassionate grounds, you know. Korea's legacy goes on. Why is that, Les? Why, why do people still hold a torch for the Korea's? Well, let's put it like this. When, when their mother died, Violet, when she died in 1982, no one had seen the twins for 13 years. No one. The press were there in their thousand. The media were there. Oh, the Cray twins, are, you know, as you know, Steve, they weren't allowed down to the graveside, um, which was totally bang out of order. And it, you know, it picked up from there, and that's where the hero worship started. Why do you think there's so many people turned out for the Cray's funerals, Les? Was it to pay the respects? Was it, was it curiosity? Was it curiosity, hero worship, um, and just for who they were? You know, there was more. Well, Ronnie's was absolutely massive. Gary had a fair-sized funeral. Charlie had a fair-sized funeral, but but Reggie's no. Can I say one thing about Gary? A lot That's of them, Gary, yeah, Gary, 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 yeah, Gary, yeah, Gary, Gary, Gary Craig, Craig, yeah, yeah. Step brothers, I used to call him. When Gary died, well, before Gary died, I was invited up to King's College Hospital where Gary was getting treated for. And I was there with Charlie and Big Ian out of, um, out of Fulham, massive. And all of a sudden, this lady consultant appeared on the scene and she said, Mr. Cray, I'd like to talk to you. So I said to Charlie, I'll leave. He went, no, 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 I want you to stay, Les. He said, because what you've been through with your tragedy, I want to... Gary died of cancer of the colon. He never died of AIDS. And this has got to stop, you know. It's been written in the books and it's about time it's stopped, you know. Poor Gary died of, uh, of cancer of the colon, you know, and Charlie was absolutely devastated, as you know, you know. I think he's the bottle or something, you know. But I went out to see him one night when Judy was there, and, it, it, you know, well, it was not Charlie no more. Has Reggie got a son? Reggie's got twins. We'll never ever meet them? I don't know. Flanagan's met, Flanagan's met Sandra. And she is the spit image of Ronnie. And now it all started. I used to work in the brewery behind that building here. And I worked with a guy called Mickey Steptoe. And he was very friendly with the guy. And um, he sent me sisters up the duff. So I said, when's she expecting? He said, not long. And apparently, apparently Reggie went into the hospital and stopped his name from being on the birth certificate. But Flanagan's met, met the girl. And the boy's called Reggie as well. Spot on, Les. Right. Superb, that takes us nicely into Flanagan. Do you want to drink? Quick yeah. drinks. When Charlie got, got us, uh, arrested over this so-called drug, drug scam, um, I had a phone call from Reggie one day, and he said, this was after Charlie had got sentenced, and he said to me, um, who's this bloke who um, set Charlie up? I went, well, all I know is his name's Peter, comes from Newcastle. Um, don't know the rest, Reg. He said, all right, Les, he said, I'll find out soon. See what I can find out. A couple of days later, he phoned me up. He said, I found him. So we got talking. He said to Reggie, be careful what you're saying. He went, Sodom. He said, I've been in here 33 years now. He said, I want your opinion. I want your opinion. He said, I know you was very, very close to Charlie. What's your opinion? T.H. I went. He went, all right, done. So, a couple of days later, the geezer was taken out. And the geezer was into drugs, pornography, everything. And um, I spoke to Joey Powell about it, you know. And he said, are there any more around? Oh, there's quite a few, you know, who had um, this set up lot. But um, I think the main one was taken out. And that was it, that was it. But um, I'll, I'll tell another little story as well. When Charlie was um, 
in Parkhurst, Diana, that's his wife, got a telephone call one night and she was in a very distressed state. And I said to her, what's the matter, darling? She said, they won't tell me what's going on about Charlie. So I said, all right, leave it to me. So I shot at my daughter's phone and I dialed the number and this screw went, good evening, this is Parkhurst Prison. I said, I know it's Parkhurst. I said, I just dialed the number. So I said, could I speak to someone in charge? So he said, who's it in relation to? I said, my dad, Charlie Craig. So he said, your name? I said, Les Craig. Oh, he said, can you phone back in five minutes? I went, yeah, OK. Five minutes went by. I said, oh, and he came on the phone and he went, yes, can I help you? I said, I want my dad in hospital tonight. Not tomorrow, not Monday. Oh, he said, you'll have to phone the governor on Monday. I said, look, I want my dad in hospital tonight. Well. I left my daughters, I got home, I got a telephone call from Diana. Charlie was sitting up in the hospital bed, in St Mary's Hospital. And, but it was too late, it was too late. Two weeks later he died. Just through people giving him the wrong medication in Parker's prison, like they did in Franklin. You know, I miss him to bits, I think. I miss him to bits. And I, I, I still refer him to dad, I, I still say, and like when he adopted me back in the 60s, I, I still call him dad, you know, and I love him to bits. Okay. That was about... Spot on. It's you again. I've got my watch back. I'm all happy. I'm all happy now. OK, go on. Right. Maureen Flanagan, very close friend of the Cray family. Um, I'm just going to ask you some questions about the careers and generally, just from what you see, I'll just lead into different questions. Okay. Um, how did you first get to know the Cray family? I got to know Mrs Cray first when I became her hairdresser. She preferred it to somebody to come home to the house and do her hair rather than sit in um, hairdressers and keep being asked questions about her, her boys. But um, I got to know Mrs Cray very well. The first one of the brothers I met was Charlie. Charming, lovely Charlie, as we used to call him. And then maybe within a couple of weeks, I met Ronnie and Reggie, uh, who were always in front of their mother, as I've always said, gentlemen. And in front of any woman, gentlemen, no swearing, no raising of voices, no screaming and shouting. But I became to know how, for, how fussy they were with their clothes because that woman did six shirts a day. Uh, they went out in the morning at 10 o'clock with one shirt, wash and iron. They came back at six, changed again, and off they went for their meetings with another one. So she was a good washer and ironer, Mrs. Cray. Lovely lady. Um, I met the two, Auntie Rosie, Auntie May. What were um, they like? Well, I always say that Ronnie Cray got his temper from Auntie Rose. Definitely. Um, more ferocious, more non-forgiving. Um, and certainly not from Mrs. Cray. He, they didn't have their temper, they didn't have any part of them from them. Probably a little bit from the old grandfather, Grandfather Lee, the old boxer, but uh, mostly from the Auntie Rosie. And it was when Auntie Rosie, that Ronnie, you know, that's when he cut his wrist and tried to commit suicide, when Auntie Rosie died. Very, very close to that particular person. What was Charlie like, old man Charlie? Old man Charlie, well, a bit of a... Well, I don't want to speak bad of him, but really didn't want to be there, you know. Um, he didn't want to know anything about his boys. He was um, away from the army, wasn't he? Hiding away from the army, whereas they'd come to find him. Um, shouting and screaming a little bit at, at the mum, which the twin neck. So he tried to keep out of their way. Um, they were more closer to their grandfather than their father. But the person that most important in both of the twins' life was Mrs. Cray, their mum, Violet. What was an ordinary day like in Valence Road when he went round there to the well, Cray's house? What I, was it like? You know, I you knock on the door, you go in. What was right. it like? Well, the house was spotless, a little too up, too down as they were in Valence Road in those days. But she was um, a lovely lady, all singing, never swearing. Um, Charlie would sometimes be there, but mostly the twins. But they never had Brett. That was the funny part about this wonderful mother who washed and ironed and kept this wonderful house. They'd come out of their house, spruce, spar oh, sparkling, gleaming, um, and walk up Valence Road into Peliches, into Bethnal Green Road, where they had their egg and bacon and black pudding. Ronnie Cray always had black, black pudding. Um, and that's still, you know, that's been there for nearly 200 years, Peliches restaurant. Um, and then it was to meetings. Possibly just alongside here, Morris, 
was one pub where they met many times and um, for, for meetings. And round at the Carpenters, that was their other place for meetings. And then back to their mum about five o'clock, wash and change again, and then out again to do, um, no, no, let's call it a bit of skullduggery. <laughs> Excellent. Um, the careers victims, the only ever really appear in the books as mug shots. We hear very little about them. I mean, you'll have bumped into Jack McVitie, you'll have bumped into George very Cornell well. and probably Frank Mitchell as well. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a little bit mm -hmm. about each of them? Out of the three of them, I would know Jack, Jack right. McVitie, then, because he was um, a regular up at the um, Regency uh, Club in Amherst Road. And my husband, my first husband, the Flanagan husband, where I get the name from, yep. had the pub directly opposite called, um, called the Farley. And the twins, if it was a little bit too early, the two twins would go in there and have a drink. And, and, and Jack um, often came to the Farley and then he'd be over to the um, Regency. He, um, he, was, he was on pills. Um, not a very nice man to women. And that's, I think, possibly a very early stage in their association. Possibly that's what Ronnie Cray hated about him most. Without anything to do with business or whatever, it was his utter disrespect for women. The screaming, the shouting, the swearing, and, um, well, the, the old story is the old story that is true, that he threw a woman out of a moving car and, you know, and um, uh, a, a, a knife into another woman's um, part of her body and wiped, wiped the knife on his coat, leaving the Regency. So I think he was in a very, very bad way with Ronnie and Reggie Cray. Long before there was any business done, Steve. Long before that. George Cornell? Anything about George? George Cornell. I never met George Cornell. I only ever knew he was a South London man. So um, I'm, I'm really a North London girl, having come then to the East London and been many years here. Um, and I met, as I say, I met Mrs Cray and her family when I was 20. Yeah. What about the, the 60s as a whole? Um, for a young girl like you at the time, what was it? What was it like? What was the party scene like? And you know, can you describe what it was? You know, an average weekend, like a Friday and a Saturday night. There was binge Friday. drinking nowadays. What was what was your yeah. average weekend? Oh no, no binge drinking. We weren't allowed to do any binge drinking, Steve. We were and had to be ladies. You went with a boyfriend. I went with my my husband at the time when I was 17. He was 19. Um, you know, you had to be in at 11 o'clock. We'd go to Grey's in Seven Sisters Road, that's all. I'd go over to the Regency, but I would never have walked in the Regency with girls or on my own. You know, our hair was, our hair was always done perfectly, our clothes were perfectly, you know, with the tight skirts, high heel shoes, hair piled up like Dusty Springfield, lots of eye makeup. But we were, had to be, good girls. And if my husband would never have married me at the age of 20, had I not been a virgin. So, uh, completely different from today. Completely. Um, when I see them now, 17, 18, 19, um, with hardly on them and falling down in the gutter, I just think it's, um, it's against womanhood. They're not ladies, and they can't be ladies, and they never will be ladies, because that's all gone by the by. Mm. And that's why we were treated like ladies, because we behaved like them. Frances, Reggie's wife, what was she like? I knew Frances um, from Mrs. Cray's house. I've often done Frances's hair while I've been, I put her hair up into a pleat that we had in those days. Um, shy, retiring, Reggie loved her the minute he saw her. Absolute adored and loved her, um, was determined that she would be his. And then there's um, the dad, Frankie Shea, you know, her father. He was Reggie's friend at the beginning, and I think it was possibly um, they approved of the relationship at the beginning. But then, of course, they heard the tales, knew what the twins were into, and maybe didn't want their daughter to be associated with. And there was a lot of animosity when she died. A lot of animosity. You know, Reggie wanted a bearing dress with the wedding ring on, with the veil on and everything, and the family said no. There was, uh, oh, there were gonna be fights and rows. Ronnie was terribly annoyed that Reggie couldn't have his, have his wish. But um, apparently, from what I hear, she was buried in the wedding dress, but with her ordinary clothes underneath, of which her mother and father, and Reggie Cray, never knew that. Never knew that while she was in that coffin. Um, the family told me that, the old uncle, old un Cray Uncle John, and um, Kimmy and Rita, their cousins, but Reggie Cray told me that. She was buried in a wedding dress, but I knew the truth. And I think, basically, Mrs Cray knew the truth too. 
towards the back end of Reggie's sentence, while we're, while we're talking about his, his marriage, there, there was the revelation in the Sunday people about Reg, you know, coming out saying that he was possibly bisexual and, and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you think, knowing, knowing them as you did, do you think that possibly we know that Ron was openly gay? Do you think Reg was a closet homosexual and had difficulty coming at all? You know, you know him better than me on that score. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in, in that day, do you think it was because I'll of be the pressure of the 60s? I mean, I don't uh, know. No, um, um, I can't say that uh, Reggie Cray was ever gay for as long as I, uh, ever I knew him. Mm. I even spoke about that to Charlie, mm. and I was very, very close to Charlie. He mm. always called me the sister he never had. And I'd visit both brothers with Charlie Cray for a long time. I loved Charlie Cray, he was a lovely guy. And he, we, we always knew about Ronnie. Of course, I knew his associations, I knew the boyfriends, I knew about the rushes, the suits he used to give them, all beautiful young men. Um, but no, I can always say, maybe right till the end, that Reggie Cray wasn't. I would possibly say the last maybe five or six years, he possibly became bisexual. Because of his and circumstances? Because of the circumstance, because I don't think he ever saw a light at the end of the tunnel. And um, we know of two young men that shared, um, shared cells with him. When I used to visit Reggie Cray in Parkhurst, he shared a, a cell with Steve Tully. Well, I know he would have, I'm visiting Steve Tully still to this day. I visited him last week in Aylesbury. He's back in prison again. And I know from him that Reg was not gay when he was in Maidstone. Possibly, I would say, from Maidstone to Wayland, the last years, possibly he was. And as you say, from literally loneliness, I don't know, maybe a need for sex, maybe a need for companionship, and it, you can become very close to it.